Good evening. Welcome to the Weissman Art Museum for tonight's artist talk with Alexis Rockman. We'd like to start with a few important acknowledgements and announcements. First and foremost this evening, the Weissman Art Museum, it is the Weissman, I'm sorry, it is the Weissman Art Museum's honor to acknowledge the Dakota peoples on whose land we stand. We, we thank them for their relatives and for their care of the land. We recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and community, and we pay our respects to them and their culture, both past and present. Also, we want to tell you that this activity is made possible in part by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota State Arts Board operating support grant thanks to the legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and a grant from Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota. Directly following the talk tonight, you should all know we will open the floor for a short Q&A with Alexis. We are taping the talk tonight, so please wait for us to bring the microphone to you to, before you ask your question so we can make sure it gets recorded. Also, finally here, the galleries will be open until 9 tonight, so if you'd like to, after the talk, go in and take another look at the show, that would be great. And actually, finally, we would greatly appreciate it if you'd take a moment or two to give us your feedback. It helps us strengthen our programs and make them and make them in, let us know what interests interests you. You can fill out a paper or an online survey. There's paper surveys on this table and on the on the registration desk outside. And at the end of the talk, we'll give you a link for the online survey. Now, finally, I'd like to formally introduce properly introduce Alexis Rockman. Alexis is a native New Yorker and an eco warrior who began making art in the service of environmental awareness long before it was fashionable. Embarking on expeditions to far-flung locations such as Antarctica and Madagascar. In the company, also in the company of professional naturalists. As a child, Alexis explored Central Park, <laughs> the wilds of Manhattan, watched nature documentaries on television, and frequented the Museum of Natural History where his mother worked for the famed, legendary anthropologist Margaret Mead. These aspects of his youth led to an interest in drawing animals and their environments. Rockman pursued an art degree at the Rhode Island School of Design and at Manhattan's School of Visual Arts. By the mid-1980s, he gained recognition for his eerie biobotanical scenes. Driven by an intense curiosity about the natural world and an ambition to explore the pressing questions of our times, Rockman has been lauded for his impressive artistic range and for the intensity of his commitment to the environment and its preservation. The Great, Lakes, the Great Lakes cycle, which is on view here now, explores the past, present, and future of the Great Lakes. While celebrating the natural majesty and the global importance of the region, Rockman explores how the lakes are threatened by forces such as pollution, invasive species, uh, mass agriculture, and alas, urban sprawl. Tonight, he will elucidate his project further, uh, this project which addresses the waters that we all here know and love so well. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Alexis Rockman tonight. Thank you, Diane, and I want to thank Lindell for having me here, the director of the museum. Um, it's been an incredible experience, and Jamie Young for dealing with the nuts and bolts of getting me here and all of my temperamental demands, um, like playing basketball today at the gym. Um, it's great to have the project here. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis in particular, um, the land of a thousand lakes, the original Lakers. 10,000, million, does it matter? It's the original Lakers, right? Um, that's why the LA Lakers are called the uh, Lakers. Um, and my wife was wondering why the project was here the other day, because it's not on the lakes. And of course, this is a watershed issue. And I'll be discussing some of the issues I've been fascinated with about the project. Um, so I'm going to give you a little, back, a little bit of background about my history and what led me to this project um, that I started in, it's really 2013, that's a typo. Um, I had the initial um, email from Dana Fries Hansen, who Paul Haw knows, who's in the audience, so it's great to see Paul here. Um, 
who had become the director of the Grand Rapids Art Museum and CEO, and he said, we really want to do an ambitious project with you. What's your dream project? And I looked at the map and I thought about the Great Lakes as an incredible resource, not only in terms of the forthcoming water wars that unfortunately we're going to have to face. Um, and I think it's very much been ignored by historians, um, uh, natural historians, scientists. I know there's been a lot of work about the lakes being done and I learned a lot since, I, since 2013. But I wanted to know more and I wanted to find a way to have intimacy with this area. So one of the things, and this is kind of doofy, this text, but it does spell many things out. If I miss something, uh, you can, I, I think it looks leg legible. Um, and I'm not going to really um, discuss the text that's up there, but if you're interested, read it. I've been, as um, uh, Diane suggested, and to be clear, my mother was the secretary to Margaret Mead's assistant. So don't go crazy with the proximity to celebrity. Um, I think my mother was not that fond of Margaret Mead after that experience. And then she went off to graduate school to become uh, an archeologist and was the chair of um, City College Archaeology. I'm very proud of her. I'm actually working with her. She just retired. I'm working with her on a shipwreck project that's going to hopefully travel um, around the country. Um, the history of shipwrecks and uh, archaeology, um, which hopefully in incites your imagination. So um, as a kid in New York, I, an only child in case you're wondering, um, I loved Nature, it was a way of keeping me engaged and enchanted and finding things that I could draw that I loved. I um, mean, I did go to the Museum of Natural History. I also love science fiction movies. And as my interest developed, I became more and more fascinated by science, but I realized that I really didn't have the temperament to um, be a scientist. I was more interested in the Golden Field Guides or the National Geographic um, images that sort of showed how we understand these things. And one of the things that I was very lucky to be um, born at the right place where, and I think Paul and I are similar generation, where we were in high school in the 70s, late 70s. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But I got to art school in 1980, and the world had changed. And I was able to find a way to make pictorial images about natural history and pop culture that wouldn't have been possible five years earlier. Um, the Germans paved the way for ma making populist images and being cr critical of uh, consumer culture. Well, I thought if, if they can do that about Roy Lichtenstein and Roy Lichtenstein can make um, paintings about uh, cartoons, why can't I make paintings about the darker stories from natural history, which is Amer America's legacy? This is a painting that I um, I, I might as well consider it a sort of magnum opus, even though it was 15 years ago. I spent about five years on it. It's now in the Smithsonian, and it's imagining what climate change will do to Brooklyn and, the, and Manhattan. You're on the Manhattan um, side of the East River looking towards Brooklyn and Long Island, and um, little did I know that James Hansen, does anyone know who James Hansen is in this audience? So a couple of people. He became a very um, uh, adversarial and outspoken um, uh, person who had resigned from his position at NASA during the Bush administration because he was so um, uh, determined to bring climate change to the public. And he was very alarmed by the lack of attention that um, not only um, our, our government was giving it, but also uh, uh, culture and corporate America. He was my primary consultant on this project and I didn't know who he was. I was lucky enough to have an introduction to the Goddard Institute in 1999 up, and it was in Upper Manhattan. And he was one of the m maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 scientists that um, made this image credible. Um, I'm not interested in fantasy. Here and there I cherry pick some things, like if you're wondering about the um, E. coli kraken in the exhibition out there, that is obviously fantasy. I worked on Life of Pi for four years, there's a lot of fantasy in that. When I tried to talk Ang Lee out of having meerkats on that island, he just was, would have none of it and said that's, that's what's happening. Um, and I said to him, that would make no sense, They're, what would they eat, their desert, and he, he wasn't interested. And I think fantasy is a fascinating endeavor, but I think when the stakes are so high at this point that um, I, there's, there, there's more to be done with um, less fantasy. It's a difference between Star Wars and 2001. So 
One of the things that I, I'm sure you noticed if you've seen the exhibitions that I have a key, I started doing that in 1992 with a painting called Evolution. Um, and uh, uh, I realized that there was something about the didactic nature of that that engaged the audience and would keep in, in this, this period of social media where we're so much about what does it look like if it's on our phone. And that's something I have to take into account when I'm making work now. You know, obviously I might spend like six months on a painting, but I also have to have a sense that if it doesn't look good this big, it's not worth making, um, unfortunately. This is a project I did for um, Prospect 2 in New Orleans that's now in the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, and this was a perfect example of a sort of predecessor to the Great Lakes cycle where um, a curator named Dan Cameron asked me to make a very large painting. He didn't know what it should be and I started to think about what is New Orleans um, besides it's going to be underwater. It's a battleground. It's a battleground for real estate and you're dealing with this epic battle of endemic species, species that have evolved here and been here for 10 hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years, and we're dealing with a climate of um, invasive species that have transformed our landscape. So on the left, you have invasive species. You have um, a reticulated python, uh, red ants, xenopus, tilapia, domestic cat, um, uh, uh, European wild boar, and on the right, you have endemic species. Obviously, the iconography of a bald eagle is very loaded. That's intentional, um, it could be a turkey <laughs> also, um, uh, black bear and so on and so forth. So when I pitched this project to, this is actually a commission, um, a dealer named Genenza Speroni said, I wanna fund what project you want, he's very uh, charismatic and you know, one of those fairy godfathers that you wish were more common. Um, he's getting quite old now, unfortunately. He said, what, is, what do you have in mind? So I took a poster of Apocalypse Now and a Jack Kirby drawing and I put them together and I said, this is what I want to make with animals. He's like, done. <laughs> so again, you can see OCD behavior. Um, not good at conversation, but I can make lists. This is just a little bit of a background of people I've been thinking about since I was in school, things I want to challenge, but things I definitely love, you know, Homer, Thomas Moran, Church, Heed. These were somewhat of my gateway into what is America and how do we think about America and what do we think we are in the relationship to nature. So I tried to take these um, artists um, amongst many dozens or hundreds of others and contextualize you know, the current biodiversity and climate crisis and make a, not necessarily an homage, but deal with that as a, a sort of tradition that I thought was very much about what the, the national identity of America is. And you know, obviously we are so conflicted, to say the least, and I'm very conflicted. There's so many things about America that I love. Um, I generally do love these artists' work most of the time, but I have such deep um, ambivalence about our place in this context uh, of what, is, what it is to be alive um, at this moment in history. So you know what the exhibition is about. I'm gonna give you a little bit more about my history. Um, this is actually on the left is a photograph taken by Mark Dion, um, who's a very old good friend of, of mine who we're about to start working on a, um, a, a traveling survey, two person show that's gonna be 35 years of work that hopefully will travel around the world. When we were in Guyana in 1994, on the right is, um, I was hired by Discovery Channel to make some drawings and that was a fantastic. Um, opportunity to be up in the Canadian Rockies. So these are things that I've done, um, and again, to be clear, kicking and screaming, because I'm a city kid, I hate going out there, but I make myself do it, right? I'd ra As my wife says, I'd rather watch Discovery Channel than be out there and deal with that stuff, but I make myself do it. So I'm going back to Dana now. So Dana says, what do you need? And I said, you're gonna need to buy one of the paintings up front, and you're gonna to need to give me a grant to go around and do some research for weeks around Lake Michigan. And one of the stops that I made was the US Fish and Wildlife Lamprey Control um, Center in Marquette, Michigan. And who doesn't wanna hold a lamprey? Raise your hand. If you've ever seen Alien and thought about the face hugger, think about that without the face hugger part, it's just the tail. The thing is, that's a, you know, a young one, it was terrifyingly strong. 
but I had to, he was like, don't you want to put it on your forehead? I'm like, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> like all these guys have like these suction cup things because you know, they, they're jawless fish. Lampreys are one of the biggest problems in the Great Lakes in terms of their, par their, their freshwater parasites. They were let in by the Erie Canal and they came in to, um, in the mid 19th century into the Great Lakes and decimated, decimated the lake salmon, the lake trout and all the other fisheries. So they're a serious problem. Um, it's not their fault, they are lovable, if you're into jawless fish. Um, just to give you a little background, this is one of the paintings I made when I got back from that, that shot that Mark took of me in the jungle. Um, this is about a, a, a parasitic uh, a fluke that lives in a snail that lays its eggs in poop of birds and so on. It's a triangle of parasitism, um, and I'm sure that you can look into that if you want, if you just look up um, snail parasites in the neotropics. Um, other things that I've done is um, stuff for the uh, U.S. Embassy program in Antonarivo, Madagascar. As Diane said, I've been to Madagascar. I was invited by the Lemur Conservation Society. And if you ever want to go on like a death march of eco hardcoreness, that's one of them where you know, you're leaving your campsite at 2.30 in the morning to make a bus at seven in the morning down the mountain. And meanwhile, since you walked up the mountain, half the mountain's been deforested as you see it like in flames going down. I mean, it was totally nightmarish. I mean, how great is it that I get to make this painting and you know, tell the story I wanna tell with, these, um, with, with this ecology and um, it's, it gets a, a, be, to be in a position like this. Here's some watercolors I made. Other trips that I've taken to Antarctica, this is a very large um, uh, 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 multi-panel uh, work on paper and oil. Projects in uh, Tasmania. And here are the field drawings initially in my studio that are out in the gallery now, just after I finish them. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Great Lakes in depth. And um, as you know, this is what they look like. They're very young, 12,000 years old. They're a glorified puddle, right? Giant glaciers were all over North America. As they receded, that's what they are. I mean, it's 20% of the world's fresh water, but it is still this incredibly young ecosystem. To me, that's fascinating in geologic time. There you can see. And that's why the Mississippi River is so much a part of this, and that's the justification for having it here, Lindell. <laughs> that was the pitch. <laughs> the watershed. Fascinating stories, and you know, it's impossible to include them all, obviously. It's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, every project I do, I realize I'm just getting going, and then I have to like deliver the project, even, though if, even if it takes five years. How many people know that the Chicago River was reversed? Okay, that's about half the, do you know what that means? Do you know why? Who knows why? People were getting sick from drinking poop. They were drinking water out of the lake. So that's an incredible engineering feat. Here's some other ideas that you might have about the lakes, right? Here's another idea you might have. So this is a shot I took, one of the many stops I made on, you know, it was kind of like a hilarious um, death march up the uh, east side of Lake Michigan and I made a loop and I would have three meetings a day, stay at the cheapest ass hotel possible, Best Western, because I had to pay for it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say like a good 80% of the, um, the, the, the meetings were not a waste of time but not particularly helpful, like the Lighthouse Museum in the uh, Upper Peninsula. It was cool, but I, you know, I knew the picture of the Edmund Fitzgerald that they had, you know. So, but it's the idea of that you, I need to go and do this stuff to a certain extent to have a sense of credibility with myself before I can even start. Because as someone said, who happened to, used to work for me, to have a sophisticated idea about what you're doing, you have to have a sense of what you're doing. And I had to ha come here and at least have a, a, some sort of, you know, relationship to it, or I'm just a tourist. I mean, I'm still a tourist. I'm by no means an expert. Those are lampreys, um, and that's a very famous uh, picture of a lake trout. 
Here are some of the pictorial models that I used. So you're seeing this picture, right? This is like the, the official version of what nature is in this area, right? There's five posters. And when I would walk into these fish and wildlife places, I'd see them on the wall. And I'd be like, you're telling half of the story. Where is pesticides? Where is habitat loss? Where is GM, where is all this stuff that you're dealing with every day? And it's not in these pictures. And that is the role that I have using a similar language. But I very much love this picture, but this is a fantasy now, right? Flying into Minneapolis, and I was here three weeks ago, it is shocking the amount of just checkerboard activity that humans are everywhere. You, you know, every time I get on a plane, and believe me, uh, you know, climate change is a complete nightmare. Getting on a plane is gut-wrenching every time I do it because I know what I'm doing, and it's terrible. And we're stuck in this horrible feedback loop. What do we do about this, right? It's policy. That's all we can do is vote and policy. And it's a, it's a sense of futility and um, despair that I have, anger, sadness, all these things. Now I'm going to talk about the five paintings, pioneers. Right? And they're pioneers because on the left, it's how and who made their way into the lakes when they were very young. Right? You have lake sturgeon, um, uh, freshwater burbot, whitefish, and so on. And on the right, that sort of Christmas tree looking ornament stuff, I don't have a pointer, but you see that stuff coming out of that boat? Um, all that shiny stuff, and it's actually clearer here. You can see all the line drawings. Um, that is invasive stuff that's being dumped as larvae and eggs out of this cargo ship that's coming from another part of the world, the Balkans. Ru blame Russia, why not? <laughs> China, Chinese mitten crabs. It's not their fault, they are lo they're loving hitching a ride all the way here. And they like, get dumped into this lake and they're jumping for joy because there's no predators. They have nothing to stop them. Zebra mussel, you've all heard of that, round goby, so on and so forth. So as I started to learn more about this, I'm like, well, this is horrific and exciting and many of the things that I'm fascinated by. Right, you can even see the reference I used. <laughs> um, here's some graphics that I was referencing when I was making the painting. Micro, microscopic organisms and the hanging out in the ballast of these ships. What happens is these ships go into these lakes, they suck up this water, and then they go across the Atlantic they go through the Erie Canal or whatever they're doing, they come into the lakes, and then they get their goods off and they dump their ballast, and then we have this flood of billions of microorganisms that are ready to make a living. I heard a sigh. <laughs> it's, it's, it can be Blake. I hired a, um, a boat designer to make the reference that I had to use for this on the upper right, because there's no, I went on eBay, cargo ship, salty cargo ship. I need this good reference. I have to look up underneath, right? That's what I want to make, this thing of like dumping the ballast out of the ship. So I was having dinner with a collector who happens to own a shipping company. He's like, oh, I know just the person. And I was like, why didn't you pay for him? Are you making me pay for him? So there's the Ebna Fitzgerald. I'm not going to sing it. You, you all know it. But if you go back a little bit, you can see that I took that, whoops, and I moved it around and made it the sort of fulcrum of this lake, which Lake Superior is the deepest, the biggest, the cleanest. Um, the lakes and the five paintings are not five lakes, right? They're five ideas or issues that the lakes have had to face. And Lake Superior is in the best shape because it's the furthest away from Lake Erie, and the furthest away from industry, big industry, and it's the deepest and it's the coldest. So things are finding their way in there, and that's where the Edmund Fitzgerald is. Cascade. Cascade is really about, obviously, geologic time on the left, the Pleistocene, one of the glaciers as they're receding, but it's resource exploitation from the fisheries through um, uh, timber, minerals, what have you. There's a, a who's who of great shipwrecks along the bottom. The introduction of, of salmon from other parts of the world in 1966 to prop up the sport fishing industry because there's no salmon in the Great Lakes. Those are all introduced. Those were introduced for the tourism industry to get people to come here and spend money. 
right? 1966, fascinating story. And if you look, you can't really see this like colorful little smudges, and I, I'm sorry I don't have my, uh, um, my pointer, but there's a little constellation of pollinators, right? When you think about what has to happen around the Great Lakes in terms of agriculture, we all know there's a bee crisis, right? Pollinators crisis all over the world. Well, it's gonna be a dark day when those things are gone, the bees, the flies, the moths. So when you're talking about resource exploitation, you're talking about agriculture, and that's part of what this painting is about. To be clear, and I'm well aware that that is probably um, an Italian-American actor playing Iron Eyes Cody. However, as a child, I was very much motivated by that campaign. As a kid living in New York, what woke me up to like what was happening in terms of the conservation world in 1972 or one or whenever it happened, it was that silent running, soiling green, you know, I'm 10 years old. What am I gonna relate to? to? That is something that really riveted me. So this is sort of a clipboard as I started the paintings, like, oh, you know, I didn't get an, uh, an ore dock in there because it's just too big and clunky, and really, it's not that important. But it's this idea of, like, what has been happening here? And I have to sort of sift through this stuff. Another thing is, um, dealing with, uh, uh, I think his name is Marshall, who also worked with um, Jim Cameron on Titanic, doing reconstruction reference for the Titanic. I love this before and after, right? It's happy, it's going along, there it's dead on the bottom. Same ship. Spheres of influence. What I'm thinking about with this is how does globalism affect the lakes? Not only everything that's alive, that's flying in North America, probably migrates unless it's been introduced. Pigeons and whatnot, starlings. Insects, birds, they all go from Canada through the flyway down to Central and South America. Well, not only that, but there's also a history of human endeavors along the lakes. There's a little timeline as you go across from um, 19th, I mean, 18th century canoes to uh, the War of 1812 to 19th century coal uh, frigates to um, more contemporary um, cargo ships. And the thing that really got me going about this painting, and I love the, the idea of the ship, right, the, uh, the airplane, the DC-4, um, which was lost in 1950 in, in the lakes, and all, no one knows what happened to it, and then they found it um, as I was starting to make this painting, and I tried to include it. One of the stories that I wanted to include in this was <coughs> avian botulism, and it's, it's a perfect story for what we have to deal with here. Um, Avian botulism comes from the explosion of algae that is from runoff, nit uh, nitrogen and nutrients. And as that dies, it sinks to the bottom, and botulism is formed, and they're sucked out of the water by zebra mussels. They're filter feeders, right? Um, mollusks, uh, bivalves um, from the Balkans. And another organism from the Balkans, those little um, brownish um, dots in this slide, uh, round gobies eat them because they evolve with them. Well, every, every lake bird is excited to eat a fish, right? So what happens is these round gobies are full of this toxic material, and they are basically you know, poison, and these birds eat them, and they die of botulism poisoning. And it's something I learned about talking to a scientist when I was in Chicago on one of my other trips um, to do research. And that, I felt, was just so, I've never seen it in the popular press. No one's talked about it, as far as I know. Um, and I'll show you some of the reference that I have for this. And, of, co of course, mercury and sulfur from other parts of the world that just go in the airstream. Here's a sense of the flyway, obviously. Flyways. There's some of the protagonists in that botulism story. And what happens to the birds is they just suffocate and drown. Obviously, 
the lakes are landlocked, right? So they're in a watershed, and everyone knows that a watershed is basically a drawing of every tributary creek, river that goes into it, right? Except for the Chicago River <laughs> that goes the other way. So how, do the, how does the land affect the lakes, right? So here you can see agricultural activity, urban activity, and so on and so forth. This is the poster that got me so mad to make that painting because it shows just a little bit of itty bitty tractor somewhere in the back upper left. And I'm like, that is a bunch of bullshit. This is like ridiculous that this is a contemporary representation of what's happening. This is much more like it. And I don't know who did this illustration, but I think he's great. Some digital Photoshop artist. So to go back to that, my job is to integrate what I know and what's happening into these images that, you know, might have a sense of, you know, redefining how we consider our landscape so we have a sense of reality about what's happening. So we can make some policy that's going to matter. I mean, these graphs are f not that fun, but they're very helpful in terms of motivation. This is just a painting I made 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, well, 19 years ago, um, for um, uh, creative time for, and for a show that um, was concurrent. And it got me thinking about what is the job of the artist, right? You, have a, you can control your own production. The, the, the project was to show what the implications of GMOs are in the history of, of Western culture and how do we think about it, what are our hopes and fears about it? And um, it was a sort of ant antecedent to that um, watershed. Now things are getting really crazy. This is the last painting I made, and I was like, you know, I got to have a monster, right? Because I've been so straight. As I said, there's a place for fantasy in that. So I, E. coli diseases, this is called forces of change, as you can see. But what are the forces of change? They're geology, right? There are human engineering, how have the lakes been transformed, but also something that's invisible to us, diseases, right? So much of our sexuality, the reason sex exists is as an arms race to beat diseases from killing us, right? We're changing up our genetic information and shuffling the cards so that diseases can ambush us and be predictable. And that's what's a fascinating thing. So that's how I started to think about this E. coli kraken, um, which is that center octopusy thing, and I was thinking about when I was working on Life of Pi, and this idea of how do you inform what you're doing with, and that's what those colorful balls are also, uh, viruses and uh, bacteria. Um, but then again, there's Lockport on the upper right. Has anyone been to Lockport, New York? Oh, I'm so happy. I've never been there. That is the first, the flight of five. Has anyone ever seen that? That is the first of the locked, <coughs> excuse me, the, made it possible to go into the lakes. So that's what's on the upper right. Then you have various things from all over the country, all over that area, um, Ohio, um, Buffalo. It's not that, it, this is not a place. This is a place of the mind. The, the, um, the uh, Frederick Church on the upper left, Horseshoe Falls, um, which I just saw at the Met um, last year, which I didn't, no one knew where it was, and then suddenly it appeared, which is great. So, private collection, Seattle. Um, some like, you know, Silicon Valley person. Um, so again, you know, you have on the left this sort of like, what did it look like before engineering happened? There's diseases, there's all this other stuff. And again, this is the glaciation of, you know, what formed the lakes. Here's the plein air study that uh, Church did of that area. Here's the flight of, uh, flight of five. That means flight of, you put your boat, you go down, up, right? This is just other ideas of, of uh, canals and waterways, man-made waterways into the lakes. And again, we were talking about this earlier, Puck Magazine, right? Is anyone familiar with Puck Magazine? Great, you know, poli political cartoons, right? Brought people to their knees that had towering power, right? So this idea of, this is the standard oil octopus, right? showing how America is controlled by this monster. Um, some things never change. Um, 
which is brilliant. I started to want to integrate some of that type of iconography into what I was doing. And obviously, you know, pretty anonymous computer uh, uh, illustrations. Now, the watercolors, you ask why watercolors? Well, because I'm good at them, one. <laughs> Another thing is there's so many ideas that I couldn't get at that didn't have a place in the paintings, and I did them last. And that was like the fun part was like, there's no goddamn moose in these paintings. How is that possible? Anything about the Great Lake, anything about anything, if you can justify it, has to have a moose, right? Bullwinkle. Yes. So again, as a kid from New York, I have done some camping and so on and so forth, but my imagination is also informed by pop culture, field and stream. I mean, how many times have you been fishing and it looked that cool? <laughs> this I find just very moving. Um, you see the sort of glance. This is obviously hunting, which I didn't get around to really. Um, but you see he's like, coming back on Christmas week and he's like, I bet there's a bear down there. I'm going to go back and shoot it, right? Doesn't that, isn't that what that gesture means? I'm sorry? Oh, is free hunting doom? That's the question there as well. I'm sorry? Oh, is free hunting doom? Oh, I don't know about the, the I don't. Well, the caption. Oh, I, I don't even know what that means. See, I don't even read. <laughs> Fantasies about fishing, right? So, I've, I've been ice fishing once, full disclosure, and I barely remember it because I got so drunk. But I love the idea of it, and this is one of the things I love, which is this idea that you have this fantasy that anything's possible. It's almost like this glorious world below you, if you're sober enough to have that sense. And um, you know, any, there's, it's a magical, enchanted place where you know you have a muscalange and a lake sturgeon and a white fish and a yellow perch and a, um, a largemouth bass and anything's possible. So that's, there's too many people. <laughs> and again, this is more good news, right? This is a healthy drop of water. So I couldn't be all pessimistic. And it's coming from the tradition of, and what is this guy's name? Ned Seidler, right? I grew up loving this type of illustration um, and oh my god 10 years ago I saw it in a gallery and it was for sale and I just didn't have the money the, the original illustration and I'm it just kills me it was like this big air brought from the 70s it was just fantastic anyway that drop of water was inspired by that little circle in there right it's a mirror I mean not a mirror it's a lens into the microscopic world, you're holding up a magnifying glass, a microscope, whatever. And of course, these animals would never be in this cattle call of, you know, this is like the school of Athens for, you know, East Coast in, uh, ecology. And that's what I love about it. Here's taking that idea of the caricature from Puck and using something that was a send up of, of politicians from Chicago and does anyone know what Bubbly Creek is in Chicago? One person. What is it? And why is it called that? Right. Exactly. So I had this. I saw this photograph of a chicken walking on the surface of the water because it was so disgustingly polluted with the carcasses of, you know, Chicago was literally every cow that was, dis, you know killed and turned into meat in America, their carcasses were thrown into this water and all the fat would flow to the surface. So I made this fantasia of political caricatures of the late 19th century with the chicken and you can see into its body on the top. So that's somewhat of the tradition that that's coming from. After I finished the, the cascade painting with the pollinators, I realized no one's ever going to see those things that are like this big. And we're dealing with the world of phones. Now, even then, in 2000 and what year did I make this? 17? 16? Um, I knew that I wanted to make something that used, that celebrated the pollinators. So that's what this watercolor. And remember, these are 72 inches tall. 
This is the invasive species lamprey chimera, right? And this is made up of, and everyone knows those composite, the com tradition of composites from Indian miniatures through Archambaldo, all this sort of enchanted push me, pull you in and out. Um, it's made out of many invaders from carb, blood red shrimp, um, round goby, some salmon, zebra mussels, and um, so on and so forth. And here's a drawing for it. And here's one of the concept art um, drawings I made for Life of Pi, so it's coming out of that, and I made that in 2009. And here's a still, two stills of it. So you can see what um, uh, Bouffe, a French animation company in Paris, did when I thought they did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Questions? I, you have the, um, the, the light. That was a fantastic to, uh, presentation. I love your work. Uh, two questions. One is, um, I didn't have, oh, okay. oh, yes. Start over. Uh -oh. Fantastic presentation. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One is, um, you were lamenting one of the depictions of the natural world, and you said, there was um, just a tractor there, and it was underplaying the role of the anthropogenic side to things. But I notice you have very few um, human beings in your paintings. There was a Fisher person there. But um, I was wondering, um, was, that's very deliberate, very intentional on keeping human beings out of your paintings. The other, just quick follow-up, um, somewhat related is, I'm wondering whether, um, there isn't a deliberate um, personification of some of the sea creatures that you're depicting in the animals. They, they seem um, more um, person-like person than I would have expected. You anyway. mean anthropomorphic? Yeah, I was hesitant to use that word, but um, yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I'm, it's not something I'm conscious of. I mean, I... Well, first to answer your question about humans, I, use, I put humans in work when it's needed. It's not... There's, a, there's a, a tradition that, you know, human figuration comes with that I'm fascinated by. I think it's a, you know, interesting and dangerous thing. I mean, that's one of the reasons it's good to think about. Um, and I carefully put people in my work over the last um, 35 years, and I'm not against it. I can draw people, hands too. <laughs> Feet, I don't know. Um, in terms of the, uh, I. My wife has said that my animals look like me. I don't know what the hell that means, but <laughs> even if it's a multi-tentacled thing. I don't know what she's thinking about, but do you have a magnifying glass? Um, next question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering about if you could speak to um, the idea of being so completely didactic in, in your artworks, like just showing literally the thing itself as opposed to being more uh, lyrical, whatever, what have you, in terms of its effectiveness. Like since you, have a, you, since you have a conscious decision to want to affect people's change, do you find that, that literally showing the literal thing um, you know, is, is the best way to do it versus being sort of more melodramatic and just sort of going about change through maybe more kind of intuitive, as, as in terms of the imagery? Um, interesting question. Well, let me first say that um, being, being the, this, the talk that I'm giving tonight is about the iconography. It's not about the making of it and hopefully art has mystery and that doesn't undermine, it doesn't spill its secrets on the floor and make it uninteresting after you hear my talk. I hope it's more interesting, but um, I think the stakes are so high now that if you want to make lyrical um, work that alludes to things, that's your prerogative, but I'm a little, um, I think the stakes are too high to waste my time with that. I think it's a, um, it, we're in an absolute nightmarish crisis uh, that I see no end to.
Could you talk more about your process? Um, your compositions are extremely complicated and detailed. Are you using drawing, Photoshop? I mean, what? Everything. Everything um, at once, right? Yeah, but it all starts out with a <laughs> rectangle. And I'll tell you a story um, that I was just telling Lindell and Jamie um, uh, when we were having a beer or two. Um, one of the ways that I, I, finding ways into projects is always a, a terrifying struggle because you never know if you're gonna crack it, not in terms of whether it's gonna go over in the public, but whether you're gonna find a way to even justify doing it to yourself. So I went on my research trip with you know Best Western um, and had my three meetings a day for two weeks. And one of the stops I made was at a Starbucks with a uh, scientist, an, an ichthyologist from Northern Michigan University um, named Jill Leonard. And um, didn't know her from anyone else. I'd met plenty of people. They're all interesting or not interesting. And um, I sat down with her at a Starbucks in Marquette, Michigan. And I said, I have this idea, you know, con resource extraction and then globalism and I have five paintings. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right? Fishing expedition. She's like, well, you... So she broke it down to, you know, the watershed, um, forces of change, you know, geology, all this stuff. So I start off with a rectangle and some words and an arrow. That's how I start. So, for instance, I'm working on a painting right now, shipwrecks, right? Um, Raft of the Medusa, right? Obviously, we all know the Jericho painting in the Louvre, and if it weren't for bitumen, we could see it better. Um, the carbon that's undermined its, 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 uh, its surface, um, that's made it very, almost too dark to see. So I started to think about that as, well, what, obviously there's a you know, scandal and France was embarrassed and so on and so forth. And I don't want to get into the story, but I started to think about how am I going to find my way into this because I want to make a painting about this. I'm like, what happened to the raft after the people were rescued? So the people are gone from the Jericho painting. It's moved around, thinks it's totally my work, but it's the structure of that raft, and it's the things that are taking advantage of what's left over, because you know there was cannibalism. So fill in the blank. That's how I try to think about it. It's quasi-literary, or within a very short, you know, paragraph-long literary. Does that answer your question? And I use Photoshop and drawing and everything, you know, I fuss around and, but when it comes time to making the painting, all bets are off because they're so physical. I mean, I hope that, you know, when you see them digitally, it just, it might, it could be some Photoshop thing or whatever, but if you see them, you know that there's like a force of alchemy going on in them. Right, and I love, the, the point of making them is I get to a point where I'm like, that could be good, what do I do to make it good? from this leap. So anyway, hopefully that's, yes. Um, I was interested when you said that y you, you were trying in this work to uh, take, go for a step beyond these idealized representations of, uh, of, of the environment. You know, they, which also have this above the water and below the water view. Um, and y you've, you've created something which is, is is, is actually those, th those things you, you would not normally find in an art museum. Right. And yet you've created something which is, uh, which is doing a similar job and in fact show, showing, showing these non-idealized, what's really happening to these environments. What is it about your work do you think that uh, distinguishes it from those, apart from the fact you're showing a more realistic view, but what, what is it about your work that uh, makes them at home in a place like this? You mean like a museum? Or yeah. An art museum? Yeah. Um, interesting question. So the question, I'm gonna reframe it in a way that I think you mean, and please correct me if I'm not accurate. What's the difference between in the Photoshop illustration of before and after the creek with you know, the thing I showed you that I liked very much, um, between that and why does my work belong in a museum? Really, that's the question. Right? So, Art's job, since, you know, Duchamp or whatever, 
you could go back to wherever you want, is to challenge what you think art is, right? And to bring things from other parts of the world, African art, technology, industrial services, um, pop culture, consumer, and if it doesn't live up to what you think art should be, that's probably a good thing because that's part of my job, but hopefully it also is mysterious and compelling enough that it can't be dismissed. That's my hope. Um, I like the danger of disgraced genres from so-called high culture. That's my job too. Um, and I'm also a populist, so I need to bring in this iconography that, you know, it doesn't belong in an art museum. Well, tough shit. It's going to be in an art museum because that's what needs to be there from my perspective. And if you, if, you know, my work isn't for everyone, that's, I'm, then I'm doing a good job. But that's what I think I should be doing. Looks like you're reading something. Oh yeah, no, I, I just wrote down a couple notes during the presentation. I just wanted. Don't cheat. <laughs> Don't get scared. Oh yeah. So um, um, someone mentioned earlier that it, you had a lack of humans in your paintings, and as well, you also mentioned that it's well more so. It seems interesting to me that you, who seem that because of that, it you seem to be inter more interested in you know painting human forces as you know as human causes of you know, the, the, you're illustrating your paintings as more systemic than in driven by individuals. Um, do you think maybe you could elaborate on that? Well, if you get to the point about your question, because I really don't understand it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm do so you want to come back? We can come back yeah, to you. Yes, okay. Yes, sorry. So I had a question about the watercolors that sure. um, you made after the main paintings. Um, what was it about those images that you like felt needed to be told, but they couldn't be told within the paintings themselves? I'll give you an example. And let's go back to the moose, right? Because I have to go back to the moose. I love the moose so much, I had to make my own version of the moose when I sold it. That's how much I love the moose. Um, Large Pleistocene mammals were all over North America when humans arrived here, right? Well, there's very few left, right? We know the bison, caribou, slash reindeer, whatever you want to call it, um, moose. And because I'd already made the caribou in the cascade painting, I'd sort of taken the big megafauna thing and done something. I needed something that was like a holdover from the Ice Age there. Right? And for instance, I wanted to put the moose in, but I'm like, it's kind of redundant. So I put it like, a, I had a side folder on my computer of things I want to make. Um, they're often more optimistic, besides the chimera, which is obviously not. Um, the healthy drop of water, the pollinators, things I want to celebrate getting away from the sort of bleak, you know, umbrella of the burden of the project. So. Does that answer? Yeah. Have a little goddamn fun. Two short questions. Did you get a chance to go to the Minnesota Museum of Marine Art? Marine what? Art. No. It's all marine art. Is that here? It is, and it has. <coughs> oh. It has, it's nothing but marine art. Sounds great. No, I don't know. Including. Like what I'm they going call to the Bell Museum again tomorrow. Okay. And last time I was there, it has moved since then. And it's bigger. But anyway, and the other thing is, are you at all informed, is your work at all informed by any poets, writers like Wendell I Berry? I wish I read more. It's a sad, pathetic thing. I'm always watching some stupid thing on HBR or whatever. Okay. It's like my, I live with a writer who is constantly saying, why aren't you reading more? And she's right. I tried to listen to um, uh, Middlemarch on the plane, and the engine was too loud on the way here. But I got through about the first three or four chapters. She's like, Re listen to that. What's with you? I'm like, but Watchmen's playing. <laughs> 
I see someone back there. One of the shows that I liked uh, of yours most was one that was done in 1995 at the University of uh, Illinois uh, called uh, Second Nature. Uh, there was a wonderful article in there by uh, Stephen Jay Gould talking about how you, that work uh, looks at and challenges uh, certain scientific assumptions that are generated by hubris and other uh, 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 assumptions. Uh, assumptions, exactly. I'm just wondering how that kind of work, which was, is very different than this, uh, is carried through to the work that you're doing today. Interesting question. Well, that was a show that um, was a survey show in 1995 that went to five or six stops around America, and um, it was the first 10 years of my career. Um, one of the great joys and honors of my life was having Stephen Jay Gould write about that work, and then he wrote another essay 10 years later, following up on what I'd done since then, which is incredible, that's in the book that um, Monticelli Press published about 15 years ago. Not to plug, buy it on Amazon. Weighs about 400 pounds. Um, but it's, gr it's, a gr it's, it's really one of the things that I'm the most proud of in terms of, one of the things, oh, so to answer your question, because I strayed a little bit, I started to learn more about the biodiversity crisis and the problems that we we're gonna have. And as much as I love that work, and I do love that work, I felt that I wanted to do some other things as an activist for, I was just too upset and too angry and too alarmed. And one of the gateways um, was a commission, and we talked about this uh, earlier, Lindell and uh, Jamie. Um, I was approached by um, our, the, um, you know, Percent for the Arts in um, uh, uh, Washington State. And I, it was for the Harborview Medical Center, excuse me. Um, and I had just become familiar with David Quammen's song, you know, popular, he's a journalist who wrote about extinction and biodiversity crisis. Does anyone know David's work? You should, if you're here, you should read it, every book of his, um, Song of the Dodo and so on. So I reached out to him and he was incredibly generous and wrote back to me and so on and so forth. I started to change my interest from what I thought was certainly interesting to me, but more internal, and I wanted to look out, and I made this commission for the Harborview Medical Center that was a map of extinction, um, uh, like worst case disasters in human-induced extinction of you know, ecology or the thylacine and so on and so forth. Um, the introduction of the brown tree snake into Hawaii and uh, Guam from Northern Australia. So my interest went in that direction, and this project is pretty much a part of it, except for the chimera or some of the more, you know, sort of allegorical things. But I've made many projects or things since then that aren't, you know, public. And I consider this a public project. And I'm very democratic, but I make, I think that this, this project about the Great Lakes needs to happen now for me. And that's what I want to focus on. I could do a fucked up nightmare of the Great Lakes and have it be, a lot of fun, like the 1995 show, too, and that would be a, a, that would be like an other. That's the the binariness of life. You take a road from one to the other, and I would love to do that too if I had, you know if I lived for 200 years. But um, that is an interesting question, and you know I felt that the stakes were too high to just do that, and to have a public platform like this, I wanted to do something else. That's it, I've that, like sucked the air out of the room. <laughs> All right, it's perfect timing because now it is exactly an hour. <laughs> oh, let me get out of the way. <laughs> no, thank you, Alexis, that was great. Um, please uh, give us your feedback. You, there are paper surveys on the tables or you can um, go to this link 
<laughs> you can go to this link and give us some feedback. The galleries are open until 9 o'clock, so please go and check out the work. Um, consider uh, what Alexis has talked about and go um, uh, explore the paintings themselves. Thank you. Have a good night.